So, uh, hi, you haven't seen me before. Um, I'm James Taylor, and I am in the biology department at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm a computer scientist by training and started doing genomics and bioinformatics as a grad student, um, and then now uh, have my own lab that's a mix of biology um, and computer science. And so our interest is mainly uh, eukaryotic gene regulation. So we're very interested in um, long-range regulatory elements, chromatin structure, uh, nuclear organization. And so that's most of what goes on in the, the more research, bi biological research side of my lab. But we also, for a long time, have been concerned about um, data intensive science and what happens when uh, an area becomes data intensive and what we can do to ensure that both those methods are democratized, that people have access to them, and ensure that the quality and integrity of science doesn't suffer as these transformations happen. And so a part of that has been developing this software platform I'm going to talk to you about a bit and we're going to use uh, some during the course, which is called Galaxy, and it's a, it's a platform for, uh, a web-based platform for data analysis, primarily in genomics, but other areas as well now. And please interrupt me, ask me questions, whatever. I'm happy to uh, get completely off track. I enjoy, enjoy that, in fact. Okay. So I can obviously skip the motivation. You're all here. Um, we know that uh, data production has become, um, has, has rapidly become um, higher throughput, lower cost, sequencing being one uh, type of data production that has pushed biology very rapidly, but there are certainly um, others, things like high throughput imaging now are really um, pushing more and more data onto us, and so we ha now have these enabling technologies that investigators in all different areas of biology can take advantage of. And using this data obviously requires uh, that we have sophisticated computational statistical methods. And so the question really is how can we ensure that, we can, that everyone can use these methods while also making sure that the results remain uh, reproducible? So there's a lot of talk about scientific reproducibility you know, these days, um, fairly recently. Um, it's definitely a crisis. I would say it's a continuing crisis in genomics. And so um, I think as you're you know, looking at doing data analysis using software throughout um, this, this course and then beyond, I hope I can convince you to take very seriously questions about how you ensure that your, what you do has been documented well, is reproducible, can be verified. Um, so this is a little uh, kind of pipeline uh, inspired by a couple of colleagues of mine thinking about how we might go through an experiment. And so at the top, of course, we have an idea. Then we come up with, we design an experiment. We collect some data. Now we have data. And we have to do things like data cleaning to you know, deal with all the quality control and all the messiness that's inherent in almost every kind of data we collect. And we've got our tidy data, and now, well, we need to do some kind of analysis of that data. And that's the, you know, we're talking a lot about analysis algorithms. We'll talk a lot more about analysis approaches and algorithms. At some point, you have summaries, and maybe you do some inference on those, and maybe you get some p values or something that actually is a measure of confidence. <coughs> Now, we have this problem that at each of these stages, particularly once you have data, these are reducing uh, information very aggressively, orders of magnitude, right? So in, in sequencing, we're starting out with very large amounts of data. We're making lots of important decisions that affect our results, and yet the thing that ends up in the publication is just some summary, right? And so if we're not careful, all of the the process, which actually might be far more important for affecting the results you get, is lost if we don't have a way to capture it. And so you would say, okay, well, let's make sure that this gets captured in a publication. And so you could look at a published analysis. You can ask a couple of different questions. Here's two. Um, you can ask, is the analysis described correctly? Um, you can also ask the, a very different question that, uh, related, which is, was the analysis performed as described, right? So correctness, you can evaluate 
from the paper. But knowing whether what was done is actually what's written in the paper is a completely different question and often difficult to verify. So what we'd like is to achieve some level of computational reproducibility, meaning the analysis has been captured in sufficient detail that it can be precisely reproduced. This is not, we haven't achieved provenance, reusability, generalizability, and certainly just because something is reproducible, it's not necessarily correct. Those are all other qualities we would like to have, but it's very impossible to evaluate um, many of those criteria if you can't even reproduce the analysis. And so we can think of this as a minimum standard for our published analysis. Okay, so then we look. Uh, this is an older, uh, slightly older result, um, basically looking at microarray studies and looked at 18 experiments in nature genetics, found that less than 50% could be reproduced. So the criteria for reproducibility is I, the data that was provided, can I reproduce a figure from the paper? So we're not considering the experiment, okay? We're taking the same raw data and just asking, can I get a result, a figure that was in that paper? And more than 50% of the time, um, the answer was no here. Uh, we did this a couple of years ago for high throughput sequencing. So this is all, um, these are 50 resequencing studies. Um, now this, is, this is a smaller data set. Um, th this table, uh, I believe zero of these studies could actually be reproduced. Um, we, the, the main reason here actually turns out to be uh, really two things, like either uh, parameters that were used is a big one. So people will say, I use tool X and not provide any more information than that. Uh, and that is problematic because you can't actually, you know, determine what was done and, and do it again. Um, versions are also uh, a, a problem that we encounter a lot. So it's fairly rare that these papers uh, include all of these details. And so you can ask me, does this matter? And I will assure you again and again that it does. This is just one example showing different versions of the mapping tool BWA, so the tool for mapping short reads back to reference genomes, and um, different, the different lines are different parameters. So this is, a, this is from a study we did a couple of years ago. And uh, what we see is that the results, and this is a particular site um, in the mitochondrial genome that we're interested in, um, the results change depending on these parameters, right? These, these things really matter. Um, one more motivating example here. So the reproducibility project is a big effort to try and combat some of these problems. Uh, cancer biology is one of their first efforts where they identified 50 cancer papers, high impact, basically meaning nature, um, science, that you know, kind of impact journals um, from the 2010 to 2012. And they're currently attempting to independently replicate these, including the laboratory proportion, portion of these experiments. Um, but what's interesting for me is another group took those 50 papers and asked the question, can we just identify the resources that were used in these papers? Right? So you say, okay, they said they used an antibody. They said they used a cell line. Can you actually really identify the exact one that they used? And very, very frequently you cannot. Very frequently these things are not described with a sufficient amount of detail to be identifiable. And for our particular purpose, um, you see software over there, which is pretty bad. And so only six of 41 papers that talked about software. So these weren't targeted as computational papers. So not all of them actually talked about software. But of 41 of the 50 that did, <coughs> only in six of those could you identify all of the software they described. There were 127 different pieces of software mentioned, and only 32 of those could you exactly determine what they're doing. I find this really interesting because it also tells you how important computational methods have become to all of biology, right? These are 50 papers about cancer. There, they, there is no selection for computational here, and yet in 50 papers, we have 127 different instances of software, of different kinds of software being used. And so the next step, of course, is, well, if there's, there's that many of them and they're that important, it's kind of scary that we can't actually validate and reproduce any of these analysis. OK. In this study, yeah. did they contact the investigators? No, no. So that's um, in 
In some of ours we have, particularly with data availability. In this one, uh, they did not because they wanted to focus on the publication level verifiability. Um, so I, I will say anecdotally, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And um, we've, I, I will say very anecdotally, sometimes it feels like people don't want you to get the right answer. But that's, I wouldn't say that about any of these papers or any specific paper because I'm on video. <laughs> What's that? Yep. I, I mean, I agree. It's, it, it, the, the community has to enforce the rules. Um, it's clear that most of this needs to happen at the journal level. The journals and the editors don't necessarily have the tools to do it right, though. And so I don't, I don't think it's fair to just put this task at the journals without first coming up with some kind of standards for authors to make their work verifiable, reproducible, right? Because the, bur the burden should be on the authors and then it should be easy for reviewers and editors to verify that it was done correctly. And so you see some efforts, uh, checklists and things that are, are starting to form. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can't really expect editors in most journals to be sophisticated enough necessarily to understand all the tools in a broad field. So I think if anything, it relies more on the authors first but secondly, in reviewers, we're supposed to be experts on that particular subfield. Yeah. I, I agree, and it's, you know, it's concerning when you see reviews that obviously this, they have not attempted to run any of the things or do any analysis, but it's also, we only have so much expertise and the review burden is out of control. The, the number of reviews people are being asked to do, I think is ludicrous. <laughs> Yep. If you're a reviewer and you've got, you know, you get 10 of these a week, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, okay, I'm going to review this because <laughs> it's like it's really interesting. But you, you're not going to go through every, these supplemental materials are not controlled at all. They're yeah. usually long. And they, I agree. So it's, anyway, it's, it's a little bit. I totally agree because edition. when the methods are still part of the main manuscript, there is an incentive to make them clear, do them well, be concise, right. still accurate. With supplemental material, people are a bit lazy, right? They are. <laughs> so I totally agree with that. Okay. So I think the argument I would make is that we're still pretty far from establishing reliable best practices and capturing and communicating analysis in a reproducible way. Um, but nonetheless, here's our uh, attempt to make some head roads in this, into this. And so this is a uh, picture of the Galaxy web interface. So Galaxy is meant to be an accessible analysis environment. And so what you are seeing, <coughs> can I point with something or a stick or something? Okay. Um, so basically, uh, this, if you go to usegalaxy.org or to the URL in the other room, which is the instance that has been set up for this course, oh, sweet, thank you. Um, you'll see essentially the same screen. And so what we have across the top are different activities you can engage in. So by default, you're here in this analyze data, but then we also have, you can build workflows, shared data. So this is where you can see things other people have published and so on. We'll talk through more of this stuff. Uh, the main interface idea is over here we have all kinds of tools. And so this is built around the notion of an analysis tool. You build up analysis by running chains of tools. Each time you run an analysis, you're going to get one or more data sets that result from running that tool in your history. So this right side here is the history. And the idea is that these are immutable. Every time you run analysis, you get a data set and then it doesn't change. And uh, they can be archived. And basically, that means you have a complete uh, documentation, complete provenance for the analysis that you've done um, in, inside the system. And so uh, those are the core, I core ideas. Um, uh, it's a free uh, web service that we uh, provide with the help of NSF and Exceed and the iPlant project and a lot of people who've uh, helped step up to give the level of compute power and data storage necessary to run a service like this. Um, and so you can go to usegalaxy.org and you can um, do analysis. There are some limits to what you can do on that, on that free site, but they're pretty, um, 
uh, not too constrictive notices. Uh, it's also open source software. And so what that means is that you can, at your, for yourself or at your own institution, you can deploy an instance of this entire platform. You can use that to, sh to collaborate with others. So at exactly what is provided um, publicly can be deployed locally. It's, and I'll just also say, we also provide a lot of tools for deploying your in own instances using um, uh, cloud computing environments I'll talk a bit about later. And then finally, it's become really an open extensible platform for sharing tools and data types and workflows. And so as we've moved to a world where lots of people run galaxies, right? So we have more than 70 known public instances of Galaxy, probably at least as many running inside institutions. And so uh, all of them need to be able to share tools. And that's what's really making the platform work now is that instead of one group like us having to integrate all these tools, now we can leverage um, a, a large community to ensure that as new analysis you want to run, come out, are published, they can be quickly integrated into this platform and made available. Um, okay, so as I was saying, just a little more detail on some of these things for those who are interested in. It's all, um, the, the main unit analysis is always going to be a tool. And so what you're seeing here in the background is a tool configuration file. So for each tool, there's this textual representation and then Galaxy um, reads that and parses it and does all kinds of things and generates the web interface for you. Um, and so if, if, you know, for those of you who are on the more technical side, you can create tools and you can uh, distribute them to others. This is a, if you do write some software, some scripts or whatever, this is a really great way to um, make it easy for other people to use them to get a web interface to your tools very quickly. Um, and then once we have the tool, we can build up the user interface automatically. So this is showing a Galaxy user interface for uh, Megablast, right? Uh, and um, various databases. You could these are actually uh, 454 reads, which people might not know what 454 reads are at this point. <laughs> um, uh, so it, aligning 454 reads against NT, word size, etc. And so that's. Um, and then what we get out is, as I was saying, this is the result of running Megablast, and you can see some information here, how many hits there are, you can actually see the data, and so on. Now, where does the reproducibility angle come in? Well, everything you need to know is attached to each of these data sets. And so, for example, there's a rerun button, which seems like a um, user convenience, but also is showing you that all of the parameters that were used when this was run have been captured Exactly, and so you can take a history and you can go through and see exactly how it was done. Versions are also captured, even though this isn't displayed. So um, the Galaxy instance nowadays versions these, these tools and all of their underlying dependencies and all of that information is captured. So you can go back and reconstruct exactly what uh, was done. Then we can also capture user-generated metadata, metadata and annotations. And so histories, data sets, et cetera, you can tag them. And then those tags can be used for search and for query and organization. You can just provide um, free form metadata. So this is a great way if you have a history, you can at each step say, okay, this is why I did this. And that will be captured as well in the system. Probably what Galaxy is best known for and what people find to be one of its most useful features is the workflow system. And so here, instead of just running individual tools, we can actually uh, chain together a bunch of tools to do an entire analysis and then run them in one shot on different data. And so that's what this is showing here is like a, 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 we have two input data sets. We're going to run the select high quality segments tool and then it adds a column and then it runs a mega blast and so on. And so you can, you can build up these analysis. You can also do this by extracting a workflow from history. So um, this button looks a little different in the current Galaxy, but basically what, if you've done an analysis and you want to then take that analysis and redo it, which has become very common, right? Because nowadays we're often working, we have many different samples and we want to first take one sample, figure out how to do the analysis, get it right, extract that workflow, and now I have a workflow that I can run over hundreds of samples if I want to. And so this is a very common way that people work with Galaxy. You use the interactive mode when you're figuring out how to do it, and then you go to the workflow mode if you want to do things high throughput. And there's something, um, relatively new, but I think you'll see it in the tutorial, in the workshop, which is called a data set collection that makes this even easier. And so you can literally just take your workflow and say, run it over a thousand samples in one, with basically one click, right? Um, 
And so just for example, here is a um, typical um, differential expression RNA-seq type analysis where we're aligning, in this case, um, two different samples, doing um, transcriptome assembly, doing uh, merging, and then doing our differential expression testing. So. All right. Now, the other thing is this is meant as a collaboration and communication platform, right? We're trying to figure out how to transparently communicate um, research. And so everything in the Galaxy environment can be shared. You can make it available by a link, you can share with specific users, or you can publish, in which case the um, history will become available in the published history section of Galaxy, which is here. Right? So you can go and you can see things that other people have published. You can, um, and, you know, these are in this case pages. I'll, I'll show you what pages are, but it could be histories, it could be workflows, right? Say so you came up with a really good workflow for something, you can publish it, anyone else can discover it in Galaxy and use it. Pages are a way of trying to bring all the analysis types together. And so this is an example of a Galaxy page for a paper maybe I'll talk about later. Um, and so what we have is, you, it's, it's like a, a web-based editor, you can, you can paste in your, your supplemental information or whatever, but in addition to just the standard you know, Google Docs-like functionality, we can actually embed any Galaxy asset, histories, data sets, directly in here. And so now, as a consumer of this, compared to you know, a flat published paper or PDF, I can actually inspect the data and drill down if I want to. I can expect the, inspect the parameters and drill down if I want to right in the context of the narrative of the paper, right? And so this gives you a way that you can put context around all of your analysis without sacrificing detail. Yeah. So in terms of like sharing data, is it automatically shared whenever I work? Or I mean, is there a way to protect my data? Yeah. So, so uh, the sharing is typically um, explicit, right? So we start with things being unpublished, unshared, and then you make it shared. Oh, anyway. At the same time, don't um, read that as an indication that this is a system that is secure enough for um, public health data, for example, pa patient inf identifying information. There are definitely ways you can handle that, but that, that requires um, a, usually a separate instance of Galaxy that's been firewalled and has other network level security. Um, and that's ju those are just standard requirements for any time you want to analyze that kind of data. So if you're just worried about protecting, keeping your data private in a more informal sense, then yes, if you actually have stringent security uh, requirements using a public website, never, if you have str important data, never upload it to a public website, right? It's, that should be a rule of thumb. Any other questions? Is there a way of calling Galaxy tools in uh, a script you write another one? Yes. So um, Galaxy has a complete um, RESTful API for, so you can um, basically make calls into Galaxy to do anything you could do through the web interface. And you can do that in essentially any language. There's a module called BioBlend if you're working in Python that wraps that API with an object model to make it really easy to work with. Um, the Galaxy tools themselves are also generally just command line tools, so you could call them directly. But we find that this is actually a pretty useful um, use case because people want the provenance, they want the database, but some people don't want to use the web, web UI. And so if you go through the API, the provenance is still going to be there. The tracking is still going to be there. Mm -hmm. You could see the history. Mm -hmm. So are you getting uh, a lot of interesting metadata on like which programs people tend to use and which kind of pipelines are like being by using group dynamics to yes. figure out that? We're, um, we're careful with that. Um, you need a lot to um, not leak information, right? Um, I think there's always a concern that people may feel proprietary about the analysis that we're doing, that they are doing in the system. But we have been looking a fair bit recently at the patterns of um, what sorts of chains of tools people, people do. And um, we have some even suggestive 
capability now to try and say, okay, you know, I can, I, based on what you've done so far, here's a rank of which tools you might want to run next. Um, that's, that's pretty new. Dude, we have this argument in my lab on a weekly basis. Mallory has a, a cartoon genie that's like a DNA that looks like Clippy and she's trying to convince me to put it in the galaxy. I'm, I'm, I'm obstinate. But yes, that's basically what we're doing. <laughs> um, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You, I, 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 I'm not sure how worried one should be about uh, leaking proprietary information in that case, though. That's the, that's the one thing where I'm still thinking about it. But, but yeah, and we want to crowdsource across many Galaxy instances as well, because all the data is there. Right? That's the really nice thing is um, since day one, we've tracked every data set every job, and every Galaxy that's out there has that database. And so if we could get them all to aggregate and look at patterns, that would be very cool. Any other thoughts? Okay. Um, so let me give you an example of kind of the, the model we're thinking about here with pages. So this is that paper I mentioned. It's a few years old now. Um, but uh, basically, this is a pilot study for a project that we still have ongoing um, in some collaborators' labs, particularly um, Anton Katerina. Anton is the other PI of Galaxy. Um, and so the study here, I'll do it real quick, is to uh, um, identify uh, heteroplasmic sites, mitochondrial genome, right? So um, individuals can have multiple mitochondrial genomes, uh, multiple copies per cell, different genomes um, in, in, in different cells. And so heteroplasmic sites are sites where you actually see um, variability where you, at, at those sites, the, the, the sites are not fixed. And so say you see um, an A at 40% of the time in that individual and T 60% of the time, and that's, and that's maintained. And so the question is, um, can, you, can you detect these at very low frequencies and can you distinguish somatic from germline alterations in heteroplasmy? Where alterations are not a you know, like a, like a discrete change, like a SNP, because of the heteroplasmic phenomena, these alterations could be a, a frequency shift, right? And so the setup is um, basically here with three generations here, uh, two generations, and then each individual has um, DNA sampled from both blood and cheek, and then two independent PCRs. This is one of the workflows that um, Anton put together to actually uh, diagnose these sites in Galaxy. So all of this is done, built, and um, run entirely in Galaxy. And so we see some interesting stuff. There's some heteroplasmy. Here's some, a few sites that are interesting. You see most of these cases. You see somatic. Um, you see the frequency shifts, um, some, some germline events. And so um, detection power is good. We think we can um, get this better. But the interesting thing while we're doing this is at first we found way more heteroplasmy than made sense right so we do the analysis align the reads count it up and say, this doesn't know and so start looking at the data right and so um, this is the ucc browser for those of you who haven't played with it yet and i will you know one of the other messages i can hopefully give you is always look at the data always look at the raw data once you have a result you can always go back and ask okay what is it supported by? Is this, does this really make sense? And what we found is we actually um, were getting erroneous alignments at the ends of some of these cases, right? And so here is an example where there is what looks like um, a heteroplasmic indel, but if you then first only consider um, reads that bridge this, the region by, I think, I think we needed 50 base pairs on either side or something like, like that, then a lot of these drop out. And if we filter these so that they don't have any other indels, you see that this is in fact a fixed A. It's not heteroplasmic. It's that the heteroplasmy is because the um, alignment, there was a problem with the, how the alignments were being done. Um, so now the interesting thing is there are a couple of previous studies you can look at. Um, and one of these identified far more heteroplasmies than, um, 
than people expected. One of them showed that it was relatively infrequent. If you go back and look at some of this data, you can actually find, if you dig into the data, that some of these regions that were called in low complexity DNA, so if you can see this, is a, this appears to be a, a run of Cs, um, and so some heteroplasmids appear to be called here where they're having the same misalignment problem that uh, we were having. Okay. So the thing is, I don't, I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong, but the good thing is you can actually check my work, right? And so you can go and you can use this Galaxy page. You can look at the histories, and so here are the histories, and you can see every parameter and every detail. You can look at the data at each stage of the analysis. Here are the workflows, right? So you've got a workflow. Each step of the workflow has been annotated, explaining what that step is supposed to do. So you could say, okay, I really think this, um, this um, analysis is sensitive to parameter X. Well, you can take that workflow and you can actually just import it into your own Galaxy workspace, change that parameter, rerun everything exactly the same otherwise, and verify the result, right? So our, our hope here is that by integrating everything, integrating publication with analysis, with um, provenance, that you can um, really achieve uh, publications that can be both understandable and also verifiable. So far, so good. All right. So that's, um, that's the bulk of the story here. Um, we can describe analysis tool behavior. We can create, an, we have an analysis environment. We have a workflow system. And we have pervasive sharing publication uh, with integrated analysis. There's a few other things. So tomorrow I'll talk about, not tomorrow, sometime I'll talk about visualization and some other um, more uh, advanced capabilities of the platform. But I just want to give you a little bit of, the, of insight into how, this, uh, how you can actually use Galaxy yourself. So again, I'll say public Galaxy service. Um, it runs out of the Texas Advanced Computing Center, as I said, using computing that we borrow from so many different places. Um, and the reason for that is because you know, the site sees something like 1,000 new users per month. Um, we're, I believe we're sitting on total a bit over a petabyte of user contributed data. Um, we're at about 200,000 analysis jobs per month, so that's, that's the running of an individual tool. Um, the user curve is always, um, always increasing. Um, one of the problems we've had for a while is that you have no decrease in the number of users of the system, but the total compute availability is, um, is limiting. But in the last couple of years, um, there's been uh, fairly uh, generous uh, contributions from um, the, the, from the NSF to allow us to basically take advantage of national cyber infrastructure. So when you run jobs at Galaxy, they can act, they're actually being run um, on various compute resources at various centers across the country um, that, are, that are funded by the NSF. Um, but still you gotta ask, how can this possibly scale? And so that's one, we can definitely leverage public infrastructure but I still think the more viable way to scale is always to decentralize for nearly any problem. Um, and so that's where Galaxy has been designed uh, to run locally, customize. Um, it has pluggable interfaces to nearly any existing cluster. And so typically it's fairly straightforward if you have a cluster at your institution or um, something like that to get Galaxy running on that. And then now you have your own dedicated compute resources and so uh, you no longer have contention for these um, national resources. Um, anyway. So, uh, th so using that, this is actually what the main Galaxy instance kind of looks like right now, if you're, if you're interested. Uh, this machine is actually called Greenfield now, um, and there's a new machine that's split between Indiana and Texas called Jetstream that uh, will be coming online, but basically uh, we're, you know, it's, it's a very um, scalable system because it's taking advantage of different types and kinds of compute resources, and that's helped us, so this is now through September, uh, reg new, new registered users, no longer total, I find that graph misleading, um, and jobs executed. And so here you see this dip, and now we've moved back into a fairly linear, although that's noisy, um, range. And so, um, so 
you can definitely get work done. Now the other thing is, what, is there a sweet spot we can find in the middle where you want your own dedicated galaxy, but you don't want to deal with system administration or computers, um, which I understand. So um, for a while now, uh, we've been using uh, cloud computing. So yeah, everybody's heard cloud computing, but when I'm saying it, I'm talking about compute resources that you um, can acquire and release over the internet and on demand. And so this is things like Amazon Web Services. And so we feel like this is a very similar kind of thing to a lot of these data production technologies, very bursty in nature, widely available, relatively inexpensive. And can, so this idea that we can scale our compute to fit our data production needs um, is pretty sensible to us. And so that's where we have Galaxy on the cloud. And this is actually what we're using for the course, right? This will be an instance of Galaxy that's been started on Amazon Web Services. You'll, it, you'll, you'll be logging into it over the web. Behind, and so what you end up doing is using this tool called Cloud Launch, and you, right, it's not actually shown here, but you can, here it is. You can use a tool called Cloud Launch inside Galaxy, so this is the cloud. You can just say new cloud cluster, you put in um, some information, particularly some Amazon account information, so you will get charged. You do have to put a credit card in if you're going to do this. But then uh, what you get out is your own instance of Galaxy. So. Um, Let's see, once you've launched it, you'll now get a URL. This is a, uh, an IP address inside Amazon, and you'll get this instance of Galaxy. Behind the scenes, there's this thing you can look at called CloudMan that get, allows you to manage that cluster. And you can do things, so say here, for example, we're doing an assembly. So we have some reads, we've done a, we're doing Velvet Assembly, we need more compute resource. So now we're doing Megablast. You look on the back end here, there's a couple of things we can do. So one is we can configure this to auto scale. What that means is it's actually gonna watch the work that you're doing, make predictions about whether it's going to be cost effective for you to allocate more compute resources and do that automatically for you. And so um, what'll happen in this case, it's made a prediction, it's launching a new node and then that node now is, um, is running. You can set limits on this auto scaling so it doesn't get um, out of control. But basically this means the compute is sized to the work that you're doing automatically for you behind the scenes. And so what we've tried to do is take most of the, the infrastructure related pain out of ha having your own dedicated analysis resource. Right? So any of you if, you, if you need to do some analysis that you can't get done um, on the main Galaxy server, this is a way to have your own Galaxy. There's some other advantages here. Um, let me, what is this? Absolutely. Yes, you'll get an error in the workflow at the time when you import it, and it will tell you that that tool is not available in the Galaxy instance. If it, um, that will also happen if it, you don't have the right version of the tool. In that case, it can try and um, match it up so that it will allow you to still run even though you're using a different version than what the original author intended. Um, but, and, and then all tools, if they've gone through the tool shed, have unique identifiers. So the other thing is it will tell you you can install that tool, but that's only if you, if it's your Galaxy instance that you ad administer. Does that make sense? Other questions? Okay. So on this cloud stuff, one of the other really interesting things uh, is that the cloud provides a very attractive model for reproducibility because you can do your analysis in this CloudMan environment and then archive what you've done completely and then someone else using the cloud environment but their own money can reinstantiate that analysis and um, verify it. And so this gives us kind of a, a start at a cost model and an archival model that is very precise but also spreads out um, some of these concerns. And so in the context of CloudMan, we tried to make this easy for people. So what we have here is something, we have share this cluster. Um, and when you, when you click that button, 
it's going to create a snapshot. Actually, yeah. It creates a snapshot and gives you this string. What's actually happened is it's archived just the data part of your analysis. That includes your histories, that includes your workflow. So all the things needed to replicate what you've done. Archives that into um, Amazon storage. And this is a key that allows anyone to get that back. And now someone can go and they can start their own cloud cluster using Cloudman and say, I want, it, I want to create, but I want it to be a duplicate of what is referred to by this string. And so now I can get an environment that is exactly the same as was used to do that original analysis. All the same tools, same data. It has the analysis there, has the data there. The next step for this is actually to ship these things somewhere for long-term archival. So there's some research now, somewhat library-driven kind of research to um, do um, archival of, of these things. But this really gets us almost all the way to that perfect idea that you could have a, um, a, an archived volume like this associated with a paper that could at any time in the future be opened up and inspected and every detail could be verified. All right, so um, about tools then a little bit. So data and compute infrastructure is a hard scaling problem. Tools and workflows are a different scaling problem. It's much more about manpower, person power. And so um, we've been focusing a lot on building infrastructure for sharing tools. And so hopefully this will clear up some of the, um, some, of the some questions. So the idea with the Galaxy Toolshed is to, that users can share suites containing tools and other things. They are, it's all completely com version controlled, community annotation, rating, comments, reviews, dependency resolution. The idea here is that once a tool has passed through the tool shed, it now has complete provenance. That, that we can always get back exactly that version of the tool, exactly all of its dependencies, and the tool shed provides that archival. And so we, while there's kind of one Galaxy tool shed, there's all these different Galaxy instances, and now if I ship a workflow, from this cloud instance over here to my private Galaxy instance, the tool shed will tell you, okay, well, here are all the tools, here are all the dependencies of all of those tools, and can pull exactly the set of things you need to run an entire example analysis. The great thing about the tool shed is the um, community excitement that's generated here is m probably more than I anticipated. Um, and so there are now thousands of tools that people have contributed to the Galaxy Toolshed. And so, um, and these are in many different areas. Um, many of them are genomics, but there are, so there's a significant Galaxy proteomics community now. There's um, significant Galaxy chem informatics community now. So um, there's lots and lots of analysis tools that are available um, in here. They're giving it a number, so. Um, valid versions of tools, valid tools on the order of thousands. Um, number of times these have been used on the order of hundreds of thousands, so um, this is pretty good. Um, let me skip a little bit, to, but this, from, from a user perspective, this is hopefully more interesting. So everything, like I said, everything that passes through is versioned. The Galaxy instances are now version aware, can provide multiple versions of a tool and underlying dependencies. This is important, right? You might want to have five different versions of a particular tool. These tools change all the time. BWA is a great example where you might not want to run the latest one depending on what type of analysis you're doing. So um, it's, this, this is an important feature. Um, from the user perspective, so now if I have a Galaxy instance and I want to get a tool, if this is like a, a local instance, I can go in here, I search for BWA, it just shows it to me in the web, I say preview and install, it's going to tell me what tools it's going to install, and I say install to Galaxy, it goes doop, 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 and then you get installed. And so now I have these BWA tools in my Galaxy instance, but not only that, it's installed the underlying software in a controlled and versioned way. And so hopefully what we're achieving here is now it can, it's, it's easy for you to get um, these analysis tools. The installation and all of that can be a pain um, for these things. And so by re resolving all of the dependencies, and this makes it very easy for you to get everything you need um, all in one shot and get it direct into this environment where you get provenance, where you get workflows, where you get reproducibility. Um, let's talk about just a, one other thing that's useful here is, so there is a group of people who review tools, so we're trying to um, ensure tool quality. 
Another nice feature of this platform that's useful from both the developer and the user side are these tool citations. So we've been increasingly having citations in the actual tool configurations themselves. What this means is so if you're, if you're a developer of a tool, you can provide this appropriate citation information. But if you're a user, you can actually take a history and get appropriate references for all of the tools that you used, right? So you can generate your references for your tech, your method references anyway, for that history automatically. Um, and so you, it'll just pull this out for you and you can also get it in, you know, if you click this link, you can get um, your typical BibTeX or EndNote um, formats. <coughs> so I mentioned um, this before, but in how do, one of the biggest challenges right now, I think, is how do we, how do we scale usability? So, a couple of years ago, it wouldn't be common for one of you to show up. Did anybody show up with 1,000 RNA-seq data sets this year? It could happen, right? I mean, it's easy to produce. We can barcode and we can produce samples at that kind of scale pretty easily now. And so while I wouldn't have expected that two years ago, it wouldn't surprise me now. And so, oh, that came out really badly. Um, what we've been focusing on are these ideas of data set collections. And so one simple example is a collection of RNA-seq data sets. And so it's what it, what it is, so here what we're seeing is we've got our collection and then each sample and then the forward and reverse reads for that. We want to be able to treat that as an entity. And so we can build up different types of collections and then put them into tools and put them into workflows as a unit. And so hopefully data set collections are one way that we can solve this thousand samples kind of problem where rather than thinking about working with your data at the level of individual things, you think about what the nesting structure is and then map that onto a series of tools. And so we have, there's a you know, GUI for that, so data set collections can be, I don't know, this looks fine on my screen. Um, you, can't, you can't even see it, but basically you can now have input data set collections and what you see, can't see here are little ribbons. So basically what's happening in the workflow is it's automatically parallelizing where appropriate and then aggregating where appropriate. And so while the workflow doesn't look more complex, much more complex, it allows it to parallelize across many things. And so um, this is fairly efficient. Okay. Um, James doesn't handle when 999 go fine, but one dies. Yeah, so there's gonna be, so it pauses right now. Um, that's, that's where it's at. So if, um, say, for example, this is cufflinks here. And so say we had a thousand cufflinks. They'll, they'll run, it will pause the next step because if the next step were an aggregation, right? So it, everything keeps going until you hit an aggregation where you need to use the one that failed. At that point, it's going to pause. That's all it does right now. We could do retries um, if you, you know, one, the, one of the hardest problems is always determining if something failed for no good reason or for good reason. And uh, we, do, we do retry, we also allow the user to explicitly retry or to change parameters. And what it'll do is it'll graft it out and put you know, back in. And so it keeps the provenance of the first failed run, but then you can, you can modify parameters at that stage. Um, this is a very active area of development right now for us is the additional decision points in workflows. So um, we're, that's kind of a research project right now is to be able to, for example, what if I could say, I, if 10% of these fail, I don't care, just throw them out. That would, that would be something you might consider doing in workflow, but we can't do that right now. I fear the answer to that is that it redoes the entire workflow, but it's a, it shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not right now in, in data set collections. I mean, if you change a parameter, it does need to redo every one. So um, if, it's a retry, if it's just a retry without changing a parameter. Yeah. Yes. So there's this idea. Yeah. 
again? Does the realignment happen again? Currently, it's going to happen again. Yeah. So, yeah, there's this notion of job avoidance that we always talk about. And as we've managed to get the tools more and more and more version to the point where we think we really know exactly what's happening every time you, a job runs, um, maybe we could start doing some kind of job avoidance, right? If it's run before with exactly this, ver this version, these parameters, there's no reason why you should run that. Again, except that lots of tools are stochastic as it turns out, right? They don't necessarily give you the same result if you run it two times. And so from a reproducibility perspective, not redoing it is, it's, it's a hard call to make sometimes because I, I mean, if I, if I, if it, if it could give a different result and doesn't, that does bias you, right? Because you've reduced complexity that's going into downstream steps. If, if, if it happens to hit a very systematically biased outcome, if you never run that stochastic job again, then you've biased everything. But right, so for example, that is, is PWA, if it finds lots of multi-mountain reads, it's going to give you the top, you, you might ask for the top 50, and it's going to give you 50 random ones. Mm -hmm. But for that, for that kind of sense, you can give it a random seed to make it then be deterministic. Mm -hmm. You could. How do you give it the right seed? Okay. How do you give it the right seed? You just give it a seed, but now every time you run right. it, I mean, I th the, I, the, th the case I'm thinking about is when you, when you do a lot of these large-scale analysis, you want some stochasticity to average out biases. And if you remove that stochasticity, now you, if you put in the avoidance factor, you're going to get the same exact thing every time, which means downstream tools are not going to see a variety of potential outputs. How do you, sam if you want to sample, get a different sample every time? I don't, it's, I, I, I think it's a very, there are very compelling arguments for doing it. I just have some concerns that are fairly minor at this point. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, anything you want to know about? Anything? This is our team and people who contribute. I will mention, like I said, this is a community. So if you come out of here interested in Galaxy, um, first of all, there's seven, more than 70 known public Galaxy servers. And so you can see some of these. Um, you know, Structure-based computational biology. There's a complex social science galaxy, right? There's all kinds of things out there, um, and we have a conference every year uh, that we've been running since 2010 for people, both users and uh, developers, who want to get together and uh, talk about galaxy. And it's going to be in Indiana uh, this year. Galaxyproject.org. Any questions? Yes. Do they, so, so they all have the same tools? It's not no, no, they all have different tools. How can I find, or what, what I see on the web page is the combined list of the tools from the different servers, or how do I find so specific So a, a given instance of Galaxy has a set of tools, right? And so it, even if it's running those jobs on different servers, it, it presents a set of tools. Um, and then typically these different instances of Galaxy, it's more about they offer a different set of tools for a different domain area. Um, there is no integrated search actually across all Galaxy instances. We have that, I think we have a prototype of that. Um, it, it's a good idea, right? Being able, it's in the tool shed, be able to say, find me an instance of Galaxy that has this tool where I can run it. Um, however, Google works very well. So you can just search. Um, you, yeah, the search works, works reasonably well. But if you're using the main instance of Galaxy, the tools you're going to have are going to be, let's see. Good idea. <coughs> right. So um, there's tool search here, right? You can search. So if I'm you know, I want to do quality control. Oh, my internet connection is not good. Yeah, you get a live search, and so you can start to find tools in here. But yeah, finding tools across instances would require a little more. And you can, there, there is the. Do you understand what I mean? Or is 
I think I understand what you mean, but I also am not sure it's exactly the right kind of question, right? It's, it's on this instance of Galaxy, which is made up of many servers, but you only see this one view to it. Yeah, yeah, so that, that is running in this instance of Galaxy, yes. Except that they make you log in. Yeah, so we can go. All right, and so here are these, you know, tell you the domain and the types of tools that are available in each of these instances. We, we do a lot of maintaining metadata and documentation of this, like not systematic, but we have a very extensive wiki. We keep track of all the publications that have ever used Galaxy in a site you like group. And so if you want to learn things like that, we try and keep it all here on, um, on the Galaxy wiki. Yeah, so if you, um, if you go to Galaxy project org. Um, you'll see this will just take you directly to using Galaxy, but there's also um, all kinds of learning tools that get you into this wiki, and so there's all, all kinds of stuff in there. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, typically we use the pages functionality for that, right? Where you just would, you link the workflow and then you, see, you just see a summary of it there, right? But they can get into it if, if they want to. Um, you know, the whole thing's a little different from NIDAR, kind of similar goals, different approach. Um, we're actually working on a ability like that, which would basically be something in between that would take probably an annotated markdown document and make a page out of it so you could run and, and generate reports in that, in that kind of way. Um, there's also a lot more R integration coming in, in Galaxy, so we have something called interactive environments now. You can run R Studio inside the Galaxy environment, say, load this data set out of my history, do this, and then save it back, um, and it will keep the R session and such, just so you can see that. We're st that last piece is still kind of being worked out, how we keep the provenance graph when you've got IPython and R Studio and Galaxy all touching the same analysis, but we're getting there. That's probably a year out. No, I mean really the instance is the unit of sharing. And then and and then there's the tool shed. And so those are really the two ways. So ideally everything is in the tool shed and you pull it down into your instance. The problem is the tool shed is newer, and so there are many Galaxy instances that haven't yet adopted that, that tool shed model. So the dream is, yeah, all workflows, all tools would be in the tool shed. They would have versions, dependencies all there, and then if you wanted to use it in an instance, you, you pull it in. But um, for historical reasons, there are still workflows that are only shared at the level of certain instances and things like that. But you can always export and import a workflow from either the toolshed or your own instance. So if you see a workflow in another instance you want, you can export that and import it into your, your instance in Galaxy. There are problems there when if do you have the right tools, as was mentioned, but it can be done. So I noticed you're great, so you mentioned the RESTful API and this integration with Tumerna. I can call Galaxy from Tumerna. So that would also mean I can actually call multiple Galaxy instances. You can. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their tools where they have their tools, and you can just talk to each other. Yep. 
I, I, I agree. So I'll, I mean, I think you know my, uh, my viewpoint on this, which is I, I don't like web services architectures because you can't, you can't control what's happening behind the service. And bioinformatics has a history of having really bad web services, and this has been studied and published. And so our idea with the tool shed is at least you have the tool, you can see the tool, right? The thing that's being run is there in the tool shed, even if it's executing remotely. Um, you have more of a confidence because it'll tell you, okay, this is the GitHub or the, the, the revision in the, tool, in the tool shed. And so it's now, it, you're, you're right that it's evolving toward a more decentralized uh, web services like model. I hope it just has a little bit more um, verifiability. So federated, okay, but, but black box. Hate black boxes. Yes. Every, all of this is about getting rid of black boxes, right? Everything should be transparent. All right, cool. Thank you much.